I'd now love to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Andrew Hutchinson. Dr. Hutchinson is a lecturer of immunology at the University of Technology, Sydney, and a Fulbright postdoctoral fellow at the Yale School of Medicine. His research is focused on the development of no novel therapies for blood cancer, in particular, multiple myeloma. Dr. Hutchinson has over 10 years experience in drug development, which includes small mo molecules and monoclonal antibody therapies. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinson. Hi, uh, my name's Andrew Hutchinson. I'm a, a medical researcher. Um, we're involved, you know, my lab is involved in, in drug development for, for blood cancers, mainly multiple myeloma. Um, I guess, uh, you know, the funding, you know, for medical research in Australia is, is definitely subpar. We could definitely do a lot more, more to, you know, to fund medical research in Australia. And I guess there's, there's strides being made at the moment to, um, sorry. Um, yeah, so there's strides being made to, to try and increase the level of funding. But, um, you know, there's a number of issues. I think, you know, as a scientist, I feel very strongly about um, talking to the public about what we actually do. I think it's something a lot of scientists don't do very well. Um, and if we're going to attract funding to do our research, and obviously medical research is important, I think uh, as a scientist we need to be able to communicate to the public just where the money is actually going to um, and, and what it is we actually do. Um, so that's, that's why I'm here today. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm a, also a lecturer, so I'm, I'm also an educator. So I teach undergrads and medical students about immunology. And, um, and I guess what I'm here today is also to try and educate you. This is an edu education conference. And I wanna, want you guys to try and learn something about antibodies, uh, which are an important molecule in the immune system. And they're now molecules that we're using to treat um, a lot of diseases like cancer and autoimmune disease. So, sorry. <laughs> uh, I think it's. I think I'm on now. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah, so, yeah. Hopefully you'll, you learn something out of today. So hopefully I can do my job and teach you something about antibodies. So, it's a bit hard to see. So monoclonal antibodies. Uh, you know, there's been three great successes in medical research or immunology over the past couple of hundred years. Um, the first was vaccines, uh, discovered in the 19th century. Um, these were, you know, have, uh, you know, had tremendous success in, in treating a variety of, um, you know, dangerous pathogens, um, you know, like smallpox and things. You know, smallpox doesn't even exist in the world anymore because it's been eradicated. Measles, uh, all sorts of these polio, all so sorts of these dangerous pathogens that, that affected human health. And vaccines have been behind the eradication of these diseases in the modern world. Um, antibiotics in the 20th century, uh, these came up around you know, World War II, penicillin was the first. Obviously, bacterial infections were a huge problem um, you know, 50, 100 years ago, um, all, actually all through human, human life, they've been a problem. Uh, and now we have antibiotics that can treat bacterial infections. The third great success is happening now, and this is therapeutic antibodies. And, you know, these are a class of drugs that have only really started to come out in the last 15 years, but especially so, more so in the last uh, five, five years. Um, they've got widespread clinical use, uh, not just across um, cancer, but also in, in inflammatory disease and other diseases like, um, like allergy and even as antiviral uh, molecules. Um, but in cancer, I guess, you know, the, the first big one that came out was uh, rituxan or rituximab. And there might be some people in the audience here who've had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma who are undergoing um, rituxan. Is there anyone in here? Yep, yep. So rituxan was one of the first antibodies to come out that came out in about 1998, I think it was approved for therapy. And that's had tremendous, tremendous success in treating uh, non -Hodgkin, some types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, so, but what are antibodies, okay? So there's two broad types of cancer drugs. There's small molecules, 
And these are things, these are chemotherapy, chem, you know, chemotherapies, which are basically synthetic molecules that are developed in a lab. Um, chemists design these, and they are just that. They are small molecules, and their role is to try and inhibit the function of, of things like enzymes, um, which are these, you know, protein machines inside cells that cells need to survive. Cancer cells manipulate them. Sometimes they'll express it, uh, what we call pro-survival enzymes. And you can get a small molecule. And what a small molecule does is it tries to fit inside you know, the enzyme and stop it from working. So it, it's kind of like a, you know, you've got a cogs in a wheel and you, you stick a, a fork into it or something. The fork is the, you know, the small molecule that's stopping the machinery from working. Um, the second types of drugs are called biologics. And these are molecules that, are, that come from a living source. And these are a protein, so insulin is a biologic, it's, it's, a, it's a protein. Um, but also antibodies, antibodies are proteins, are made by cells, and that's a, that's a biological, or a biologics class of therapy. So this is a, this is a small molecule up, up here. Uh, dexamethasone, who's been on dexamethasone? I'm sure a lot of you have, yep, yep. So dexamethasone is a small molecule. This is a synthetically designed drug. Uh, it's actually a type of steroid. Um, that's what it actually looks like. That's the, the I guess, the, the structure. If you looked at a, a extremely powerful microscope, although there are no microscopes that can actually see this because it's so small. This is a, a basically a model. But that's what it would look like. Um, and antibody looks like this. It's it's a very very complex type of uh, molecule. It's, it's, you can see, compared to dexamethasone, you know, it's got a few lumps around here. But antibodies have lumps everywhere. They're these big, big proteins. And they're actually, even for a protein, they're very large. And if you just compare the size, this is dexamethasone down here, and this is, this is an antibody. And, um, sorry, we've got two screens here. Um, but you can see dexamethasone is, is exactly that. It's a small molecule, but a, a, an antibody is a much larger um, type of therapy. And if you look at the size here, dexamethasone is 1.3 nanometers in size, which is a, that's one millionth of a millimeter. And this is an antibody. So in length, it's, it's at least 10 times bigger than, a, than dexamethasone. So it's a, it's a much bigger type of molecule. Okay, so, so what do antibodies do? All right, so, I mean, you may have just heard about antibodies. Uh, that they're these things that, you know, you, often people talk about uh, having antibodies in the bloodstream that give you immunity. Um, the question is, you know, what, what are antibodies? So, you know, you go to the doctor and get a vaccine for measles, and why do you do that? Um, of course, you're trying to become immune to the measles virus. But what gives you that immunity? And there's two things that give you immunity. There's cells in your blood called lymphocytes, which we won't really get into much to today. Um, but there's also these proteins in the, in the body called antibodies. And you get this measles vaccine, and your body starts to make antibodies that are specific for proteins that the, that the measles virus has. So there are antibodies, anti-measles antibodies in the bloodstream that give you that immunity. So, you know, if you go to a doctor and they give you a blood test to try and work out if you're still immune to something, what they're trying to measure is whether you have antibodies in your bloodstream that are specific for that thing. So they may check, um, you know, they may check that if you, you still have antibodies, you may have got immunised against the measles virus 20 years ago. You go to the doctor, they'll take your blood and they'll uh, look at your blood and find that you have antibodies against measles. So antibodies give you immunity. They're in our blood, they're in all of us. They're one of the, the key things that we have that makes us immune to things. So this is hard to see if there are a lot of you up the back. Um, all this is saying, you know, antibodies do a lot of different things in the, in the blood, okay? So what antibodies can do, they can neutralize microbes. So say you have a, you know, the measles virus is starting to replicate inside your body and you've already got preformed antibodies that are specific for the measles virus, they can bind to the measles virus and basically neutralize it and stop it from, from infecting other cells. 
Um, antibodies can also cause cells called phagocytes. Um, phagocytes are these, these big cells in the body that just like to eat things up. Um, when a, um, you know, when a, a pathogen is encoded coded in anti antibodies, then suddenly the phagocyte can see uh, that that's a potential pathogen and it eats it up and gets rid of it. There's other cells, natural killer cells that use them, which we'll talk about, and complement. But antibodies do a lot of different things. So they're, they're multifaceted and they're critical mediators of the immune system. We need them to survive. So this is probably the, the most difficult slide to understand today, but I'm going to persevere. If my undergrads can understand this stuff, you guys can, trust me. <laughs> um, antibodies, so th this, is, this is an antibody, right, on the, on the right. So just focus on the image on the right. So an antibody is this, is this Y shape. So it has, um, you know, it's just a distinct Y. There's two arms at the top here where this region here is called the binding site. Antibody has two binding sites, and that's the sites that interact with other molecules. And so each antibody is different. Um, sorry, that's up here. There's a binding site there, one there, two there. Um, each antibody is different in that their binding sites can, can alter their structure so one antibody can bind to, say, measles proteins, and another antibody could bind to a molecule that's expressed on cancer cells. Each antibody is different. So, um, and they're different just in the binding site. All antibodies have this thing called an FC region, which is the same for every antibody. So that FC region is, is a part of the antibody that other cells of the immune system use to see. It's, it's like a, basically like a beacon. So if, a, if a, an antibody is um, attached to the surface of a, a cancer cell through these binding sites, this tail sticks out and there's cells in our immune system that will recognise that they can see that tail, it's like a beacon, and they grab onto the tail and then they can kill the cancer cell or kill the pathogen. So it doesn't really matter what this antibody is bound to up here, the immune system will, will just use this and kill whatever it's bound to, basically. So, um, yeah, so engineering antibodies. So in recent decades, um, we've been able to en engineer antibodies so that they can be made specific for a particular molecule. And that's through these binding sites. So we can engineer these binding sites to make them specific for any type of molecule that might be found on a, on a cancer cell uh, or a particular pathogen. So, this is a post-immunisation, so if you get immunised, you're also generating antibodies in your blood that are specific for a particular um, molecule. So you get immunised with, with, say, a protein that's on a, a measles virus. You generate antibodies in your body that will be specific for the measles virus. But it's a diff different immunisation because in immunisation, there's a lot of uh, molecules that antibodies, you know, there's, there's things going on inside our bodies that stop our, us developing antibodies against spe specific molecules. And that's especially true for molecules, you know, molecules that may be found on the surface of a cancer cell. If you try and immunise someone with a molecule that's, say, highly expressed on lymphoma cells, you just won't generate an immune response because that molecule is also found on normal cells in the body and the immune system, the, the duty of the immune system is to work out what's foreign and what's self. And because it is a self protein, you, you just can't generate antibodies against it. But what we can do with any, antibody engineering is actually take antibodies outside of the body and engineer them and make them specific for those cancer proteins. So you can now generate an immune response. So you can, you can make lots of these antibodies specific for a molecule that's found on the surface of a cancer cell. You can't do that with a vaccine. Um, because of those, these tolerance mechanisms, but you, you can do that outside of the lab. So you, we can manipulate antibodies now to make them specific for any type of protein. So up here we've got a, a case study. So we'll just try and put this into practice. So daratumumab is, I'm a myeloma researcher, so this is slightly biased to myeloma. So Daratumumab is an antibody therapy for myeloma that received breakthrough designation by the FDA. So the FDA is the US uh, Food and Drug Administration. They're, they're probably the most drugs initially get screened through the US, get approved by the US before they then enter the Australian market. So 
Daratumumab last year got breakthrough designation by the FDA, which was, which was huge. Um, that had never happened for a monoclonal antibody in myeloma. Um, this is for a phase one clinical trial, and now phase two trials have started in, in the US. And it's anticipated, because it's got breakthrough designation, um, it, it, if it all goes well, it could potentially reach the market within a couple of years for, you know, for patients. So this antibody was designed to target a molecule called CD38. We have these funny names um, for all these um, proteins. Um, there's just so many, there's like 20 or 30,000 proteins in the body. So we have to designate them these simple terms, CD38. Um, and CD38 is found on the surface of myeloma cells. So it's mainly found on the surface of myeloma cells. Some other cells have it, but myeloma cells express these in a very high amount. So that makes it an attractive target for an antibody therapy. So how does daratumumab work? And there's three mechanisms. Um, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, ADCC. These are all mouthful. Antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis and complement-dependent cytotoxicity, CDC. And I'll talk about these. Um, so just reminding you of the antibody structure. We have our binding sites up here. So two binding sites. So that these binding sites combine to CD38. And then we have this FC region, and that FC region is kind of like the beacon that allows the immune system to see um, a potential cancer, cancerous cell. So this is what ADCC is. So basically, we've got a myeloma cell here, and then on the surface of the myeloma cell is um, CD38, so the, these molecules that's sticking on the, the cell membrane of the myeloma cell. And then this daratumumab antibody comes along, which has been designed specifically to recognize CD38. And what that does, it, it coats the myeloma cell in this antibody. And at the tail region here is this FC region, this, um, this tail region of the antibody, which other immune cells can recognize. Um, it's just there. And this other cell comes along, this really important um, immune system cell called a natural killer cell, and that's exactly what it does. It's a, it's a killer cell. It likes to kill things. It comes along, and it has these antibody receptors on its surface that, that bind to that tail of the antibody. And it doesn't really know what it's looking at. It just knows that it's, it's a cell that's coated in an antibody. It doesn't know if it's a myeloma cell or whatever. Um, but this antibody, because it's specific for CD38 and the myeloma cell, is, is attached to it. Natural killer cell comes along, attaches to the ends of it, and then it sends signals to the myeloma cell to die. It, it, it sends out uh, lytic things that punch holes in the cell membrane and, and cause the, the cell to burst apart. And it also tells it to, to commit suicide, basically. Um, yeah, which is called apoptosis, we call that, but it's cell suicide. So cells uh, will kill themselves if they're given the right signals to do so. so this this is an animation of an antibody in, in practice. So this, is, this could be any antibody, but we'll say this is daratumumab against CD38. So here we've got all our myeloma cells that are sitting in the bone marrow. And there's some good cells here too. These are hematopoietic stem cells. These are non-cancerous cells, which, um, which are good, and we don't want to target them. But we've got the myeloma cells around here uh, doing what they're doing. They're cancer, they're growing, and they're no good. On the surface is this, this CD38 molecule that the, all the myeloma cells express, but the healthy cells don't express it either. And there they are just sitting there. Then we've got the healthy cells here which don't express CD38 on the surface, it's just the myeloma cells. So these are hematopoietic, hematopoietic stem cells, we call them. They're stem cells, they give rise to new blood systems. So we want them to survive, but we want to kill off these myeloma cells. So you take daratumumab, and remember this is specific for CD38. This is an antibody. And that's down the bottom there is the FC region, which these natural killer cells can recognize. So they float around in the blood, and they're basically trying to find CD38. And then they'll stick to CD38 on the surface of the myeloma cells. And then this tail is sticking out. And here comes a natural killer cell that has a receptor specific for that tail. It can bind to the tail. And there it is there. It's bound to the tail. And then it starts to send signals to the myeloma cell to kill itself. 
and that's it. So that's, that's one of the mechanisms of how antibodies work, not the only one. <laughs> not, um. Okay, so that, that's ADCC. And I actually, I'll show you what it looks like under a microscope. That was an animation, that was an animation but Um, so this is this is a this is under a microscope. Can anyone guess which one's the cancer cell and which one's the natural killer cell? <laughs> big one. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yep, yeah, it's the big one. Yep. Yeah. So here's a big cancer cell, and here's the natural killer cell. Okay. <laughs> so the natural killer cell is bound to the cancer cell with these via these antibodies. Um, watch what happens. This is. Yeah, under a microscope, yep. Yep, yep. Yeah, it takes, um, so now it's all shriveled up and that's died basically, it's a dead cell now. Yep. Um, so it normally takes anywhere from about eight hours to a day, um, but that's, that's in vitro, that's outside of the lab. Inside a body it can take a lot longer. The, the effects take more time. Yeah, you know, in, in a lab it's, it's a bit artificial because we're, we're trying to throw everything at it at once. Uh, in the body, there's a lot more things going on so it can slow down that process, yeah. Okay, so have you learnt something, something yet? <laughs> yeah, good, that's my job. Okay, so that's ADCC. Uh, the other, another mechanism is antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis, so another, another mouthful, but we just call it AD, ADCP for short. So phagocytosis uh, is, a, is a combination of some ancient Greek words. So phagin means to devour, and kytos or cytos means cell. So what phagocytosis is, is literally the eating of another cell. So there's special cells in our bodies called phagocytes, which are these white blood cells, immune system cells, that engulf other cells, they, they eat other cells. And these phagocytes also have these antibody receptors. So if they see a cell coated in antibodies, they'll know to eat it, basically. Um, so antibody, yeah, antibody coated cancer cells can be eaten by phagocytes. And so this is just an example. This is our myeloma cell with daratumumab on the surface bound to CD38. And here's a phagocyte. Uh, it has this FC receptor, so it can see the antibody. And it binds, and it basically starts eating up bits of it. It starts to ingest bits of it, starts you know, eating away at it, until it's broken down and, and killed the cell. So this, this might be a bit hard to see, especially if you're red-green colorblind. <laughs> For some reason, we always use red and green in, in um, medical research. I don't know why. Um, so it may not help if you're red, red green, colorblind. It's a bit hard to see, but. Um, you're not colorblind, eh? No, I'm not. <laughs> but what you see, uh, this, is very, this is still hard to see even for me. I'm not colorblind, but um, you can see this cell here. But see this little bit of green bit that's come off? But this is, these red cells are the macrophages, are the phagocytes and these are the cancer cells. And there's bits of this cancer cell that's broken off and is now being engulfed, and some smaller bits down here. And they'll just eat away at these cells until, until they disappear, basically. Yeah, it's not, not the best, best one, but um, yeah, they, they, these cells get eaten up. You can see little bits breaking up here at the very end that are coming off, which are being engulfed by these phagocytes. And then the last one, this is another complicated slide. I even tell my undergrads not to bother learning about this so much <laughs> because it's very complicated. But this is the other one, is another mechanism of antibodies is what we call complement dependent cytotoxicity. And these are complement proteins are just these, these molecules that 
sit around in our blood. And what they do is, is they punch holes in cell membranes. Um, so if you're infected with a bacteria, complement proteins will bind to the surface of the bacteri bacteria and basically punch holes into the bacteria. And what we call, we li they lyse them. It's basically where well, they punch holes and then kill the, the bacteria cells. But antibodies also do this as well. So you can get an antibody coated on the surface of a cancer cell. And then complement proteins can also bind to, those, um, to that tail region of the antibody and recruit other complement proteins which punch holes in, into the cell membrane and kill the cancer cells. So the cancer cells leak out all the stuff that's inside of them and, and kills them. So that's the three, three main mechanisms of how these antibodies work. I'm going to the time, okay. So that's the three main mechanisms of how these antibodies work, um, how they kill cancer cells, antibody-dependent cell, cell cytotoxicity with those natural killer cells, uh, antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis with the phagocytes which get eaten up, and then complement-dependent cytotoxicity where the antibodies help punch holes in the cell membrane. Um, antibodies are reliant on the immune system. Um, you know, all these, all these, all, all, you can think of antibodies as just as a beacon. Uh, they go, they bind to potential pathogens like cancer cells and things. And they just alert the immune system that there's danger. But the problem with um, cancer patients is that it's now known that the immune system is, is, can be very suppressed. And so, although these antibodies, um, have great potential and have, you know, have been able to treat a lot of, lot of cancers and, you know, they still have a, a lot of effects in, in cancer patients. They don't work as well as they should because of this suppressed immune system. So they, they could work a lot better. Um, if you were healthy and you didn't have cancer, you had a healthy immune system, your antibodies, if you had an antibody therapy, it would work a lot better than someone who has a suppressed immune system from cancer. So, there's been a bit of a paradigm shift in the way we think about cancer therapies, and this is especially happening now, um, even over the last few years. So the traditional view of treating cancer, or well, the traditional idea of cancer is that it's, it's uncontrolled growth of cancer cells caused by a genetic mutation. But the, I guess the, the shifting view is that, yes, that, that's also the case, but the other issue, it's, it's the failure of the immune system to recognise a cell as being potentially cancerous. And so really, cancer is, is a, it's two-pronged, right? It's uncontrolled growth of cancer cells caused by genetic mutation. That's happening inside a cancer cell. But the other issue is, is, is probably just as bad, is the immune system, for some reason, has stopped recognising cancer cells as being cancerous. And although this is, you know, maybe another complicated slide, but it, it, I think it explains it nicely and I'll walk you through it. Up here we've got um, some, some cells here and, and in the, the grey cells are the healthy cells and the red cells are the cells that are becoming potentially cancerous. So the red cells are potentially dangerous cells. Normally what happens is the immune system sees these red cells as being dangerous. And there's all sorts of immune cells come in, all these yellow cells, blue cells, brown cells. These are all immune system cells. There's lots of different immune system cells that do stuff. They will go in and they'll just get rid of those cells before they become cancerous. They recognise them as being potentially cancerous, but they get rid of them um, in the normal situation. And this happens in our bodies all the time. You know, I don't even know what the estimates are, but there's probably 10, 20,000 cells a day in our body that become potentially cancerous, and our immune system gets rid of them. And that's what happens here. But sometimes um, these, these cells aren't fully, you know, the, the immune system doesn't get rid of all these cells as it should. And the cancer cells can secrete anti-inflammatory molecules that suppress the activity of the immune system cells. So the immune system cells don't recognize uh, them as being potentially cancerous, so they're suppressed. And they'll be in this equilibrium effect for a while. And, you know, a, a good way to think of it is like a, a benign mole. Moles are potentially cancerous. They have genetic mutations. Our immune system doesn't get rid of them always. Sometimes they do, but they often will sit there as benign. Over time, they can acquire genetic mutations that can make them cancerous, like melanoma. 
and this is true for blood cancers as well. Um, and when that happens, you get immune escape, and no longer is the immune system recognising these cells as being potentially cancerous anymore, and that's when a cancer really turns into something dangerous, or a precancerous cell turns into something dangerous as a cancer, when it starts to suppress the immune system. Then it starts to grow out of, you know, out of control growth and causes cancer. So often, you know, the immune system is very important for keeping precancerous cells in check. It either gets rid of them or it attacks enough of them so it doesn't cause too much of a problem like a benign mole. But if it doesn't get rid of them, then over time it can develop into a cancer and the immune system just stops recognising them as being cancerous. So the cancerous cells can secrete anti-inflammatory molecules that suppress the immune system and then you, grow, you get out of control cancer. So this is, I mean, another slide here. This is just off the National Cancer Institute website. It's, a, it's an American website, but it's highly informative um, for explaining these, and they're made for, for patients uh, to try and understand what might be going on in their bodies um, when they have cancer. But as you can hear, see here, you've got a cancer cell, and the immune system is fighting it. You know, it it's quite often trying to fight the cancer cells. When the immune system's too suppressed, that's when the cancer cells can grow out of control. So we've got antibodies up here that are helping trying to clear the cancer cell. We have our natural killer cells, so the cells that cause the cells to die by cell suicide. We have our macrophages, these are these phagocytes that eat up cancer cells. But over here are these other cells called T cells. Um, and these are perhaps the most important cell type involved in cancer control. So we've, we've already spoken about these other cell types today, but these T cells are what's really important. And T cells are they're a type of white blood cell, you know, as I said, that are very effective at killing cancer cells. They're also very effective at killing other cells. And I, I just found this last night. Um, this is a killer T cell. And here it is shooting a, a gun at a virus infected cell, bacteria infected cell, but also cancer cells. T cells are really important. In fact, patients who have HIV have depleted T cells, and that's why they end up with. Um, such an immune system dysfunction because they don't have a, a certain type of T cell in their body. So T cells are absolutely important for the immune system and they're absolutely important in controlling cancer cells. So in cancer patients, for some reason, these T cells, are, they, they simply don't respond properly or you know, they're just switched off. They're not doing their job. They're there, but they're not doing their job. They're switched off. So lots of cancer research now is focused on trying to stimulate these T cells to reactivate them and get them to fight the cancer cells again. And the, the, I guess the first example of this was, was small molecules, so thalidomide analogs, so revlimid um, and thalidomide are drugs that stimulate T cells and NK cells. They try and get them to become reactivated. That's how they appear to work. But now, um, and this is an exciting area of, of research at the moment, uh, antibody therapies are now also entering the fray as, um, as therapies that may be able to reactivate these T cells. So how can antibodies be used to stimulate T cells? So T cells rely on a combination of activation and inhibitory signals, which they receive from other immune cells. So, they will interact with other immune cells, and those immune cells will either give them activation signals or inhibitory signals. And if they're given in enough activation signals as opposed to inhibitory signals, they become active. If they're given too much in inhibition signals, then they become suppressed and they, they're inactive and they don't do their job. And these molecules that do this, are, they're just called cell surface receptors, and they sit on the, on the surface of the T cells, and they interact with other cell surface receptors that are on the immune cells that are trying to train the T cells. And remember that antibodies can be engineered to bind to pretty much any type of molecule, and this includes cell surface receptors. So what antibodies are being used, to, used for now, and this is um, you know, big developments over the last few years, is, is to actually design antibodies to block these inhibitory receptors, to bind to things on the T cells or the cells training the T cells and stop those inhibition um, signaling events to happen so the cell remains activated. So if you just look at this slide here, this, this, is, this is a T cell here. It gets trained by these cells called, well this, you know, you know, this is called a dendritic cell, but dendritic cells basically train T cells. 
and they tell T cells to either be switched on and become activated or be switched off. And if, uh, if these dendritic cells tell the T cell to become activated, the T cell starts to, first of all, it starts to divide, it makes more copies of itself, um, but it's also activated. And any time it then sees a cancer cell, it can kill the cancer cell directly because it's been activated and it's not suppressed. And if you just have a look, this is, you know, a, another potentially complicated diagram, but this is the interaction happening between a dendritic cell and a T cell. And here's an activation signal here, um, this B7 molecule on the cell training the T cell with CD28. So when that CD28 interacts with B7, this cell potentially becomes activated. But there's also this inhibitory signaling that also happens. And on the surface of the T cell is this molecule called CTLA4. And when that gets hit by B7, it, it suppresses the act activation of the T cell. So it switches the T cell off. So what antibodies are doing, there's anti-CTLA4 antibodies which bind to CTLA4 and stop this inhibition signaling from happening. So this T cell only gets activation signals and becomes active. And that's one of the things that's, that's happening um, as, as a new antibody therapy. It's trying to block this signaling, this inhibition signaling to keep these T cells activated so they can kill cancer cells. And then there's another type of um, antibody as well that's, that binds to um, receptors on the cancer cell itself. So what cancer cells can do is upregulate these inhibitory molecules too, and they can be on the surface of the cancer cell. So when a T cell goes to try and kill the cancer cell, uh, it, it can engage one of these inhibitory receptors on the T cell and switch the T cell off before it kills it. So very, very tricky. But um, now there's antibodies being developed that combine to these in inhibitory signals on the actual cancer cells or on the T cells and stop that signaling from happening as well. And these antibodies are now being used in combination trials um, to try and re-stimulate the immune system and they're having, having a lot of effect. So they have the potential to be used in many types of cancers, so not just blood cancers but also solid tumours and, and everything else because, as I said, the immune system is suppressed in most cancers. So if you can re-stimulate the T cells then you can um, trying to eradicate the tumours. So, potentially used in solid tumours and also blood cancers. And where are they in development? So there's many of these in development over the moment. It's the hot area in antibody therapeutics. There's anti-CTLA-4 therapy, so there's antibody called Yervoy, um, which is a, a funny name, but Yervoy is an anti-CTLA-4 therapy that's already been approved for melanoma and multiple clin clinical trials for other type of cancers are ongoing, including blood cancers. And there's other what we call biosimilars, so other anti-CTLA-4 antibodies in development that are also, um, you know, very exciting. And then we also have these anti-PD-1 therapies, um, which are also near approval for melanoma, but also, again, multiple clinical trials for blood cancers as well. So it's an exciting time. Um, a, a friend of mine was just over at the um, uh, actually, now another antibody engineer was over at um, ASCO, which is the big American conference for cancer, uh, last week, and he said that all the talks, you know, at least on antibodies, were all dedicated to this. He said everyone was, all the clinicians, everyone was extremely excited about what was going on with these um, T cell blockade therapies, which are these antibodies.